Hello, hello, good day, and a very warm welcome to the third episode of this series on climate adaption. My name is Rudy van Beurde, and I may be your host yet again for this upcoming hour. And today we will be covering yet again a new topic with two experts from various locations in the world. Um, so good that you are joining. Please have your notepads out because um, it's going to be packed with lots of information and insights. And it's also good to know that this is being recorded and eventually it will be visible on the website that I provide you with later on. But first and foremost, before I share some more details, um, maybe you have seen the other episodes as well. They are all online on the, on the website. And it's good to know, to point out for me that it's going to be interactive before I will show you the two experts that we have waiting behind the screen. I will tell you that um, this is fully anonymous. So your names will not be shown, but it is possible to interact. And that's been done by using the Q and A button. You can see that in the menu bar, and in there, you can have these in-depth questions or whatever question you have for the both experts that we will have coming on. And also you can upvote questions that are in there already from other people who are viewing this very webinar. If something goes wrong, if you cannot hear us, if the internet is lagging or whatsoever, then please use the chat button. And in there, you can ask for technical support. And my colleague will be very quick on her feet to make it possible. Here you can also see the website www.platformwow.nl and on there you find way more content both in Dutch as well as this series in English for you to gain even more knowledge than in this upcoming hour. All right, having said all of that, please sit back, enjoy, interact with us by telling or by asking questions in the chat and the Q&A. And then for now, I actually would love to welcome both of our guests. So please swing on those cameras just for a little bit and your microphones as well. We've got Charlie Showers and also Kaspar Gehlen. A very good day to the both of you. Uh, Charlie, to start off with you, you come to us all the way from Australia. It's the end of the day. Um, and where are you located, if we may ask? Hi, Rudy, thanks for having me. I I'm located in the very bottom southeast corner of Australia. So I'm about three hours north of Melbourne. North of Melbourne, and that's in the state of Victoria, isn't it? That's correct. Yes, and there you work, Charlie. Um, actually, you've got two positions, but the one we will be focusing on now is, and the background is giving it away as well, bushfires and all the negative consequences with that but you actually want to prevent this from happening, ha happening. And you work together with the University of Melbourne on preventing these landslides, isn't it? That's right. So I'm a geologist with the Victorian government and I specialize in, in post-fire hydrology. Excellent. So that's we will what hear I'll be more of that today. Sweet, as the first speaker, just in a minute time. Excellent, great for having you all the way from Australia. And then our second expert will be Kaspar Gehle. You are a PhD researcher uh, attached to the Wageningen University and Research that's right in the center of the Netherlands. And also, also you work part-time for WETSUS. And that's like a European program for excellence on water technology, if I'm correct, isn't it? Yeah, the PhD and, is finished, but I'm a research a researcher uh, associated ah, with both uh, places still. Yeah, excellent. And you will dive a little bit more into monitoring monitoring the water system, so also using data for that. That's correct. Yeah, excellent. So we will be focusing on those two various topics: harvesting data, harnessing data to make the water system more robust. And we will start with the first presentation from Charlie followed by Kaspar, and afterwards there will be heaps of time for a Q&A in which the three of us will be interacting with all the questions that definitely will pour in. But for now, Charlie, I ask you kindly uh, to swing on those slides. Please show them full screen. And then Kaspar, we will see you in a bit. 
and I will be back shortly as well. Here we go. Fantastic. You, go. you can see that there, Rudy. Yeah, good luck. Here you go. Great. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for having me out there in the, the wider climate um, adaptation community. So um, as was explained before, I'm Charlie Showers. I'm a geologist with the Victorian government in Australia. I specialise in what we call post-fire hydrogeomorphic risk. And I'll explain a little bit about um, first where I'm located. So just to give you a bit of context, what I'm talking about today are risks that we deal with in the southeast corner of Australia. This is the most mountainous and most fire prone part of Australia. Um, I'm in the state of Victoria, which is shown in the very bottom corner there. But these problems happen throughout the New South Wales and Victorian mountainous areas. The areas shown in red there are the areas that were impacted by the, the fires in Australia in 2019, 2020, just to give you some context. So post-fire hydrogeomorphic risk, it's a very large uh, collection of words, but to simplify it for you, what we mean by that is basically water-driven erosion that happens post-fire. After fire, we obviously have uh, denuded catchments. So we've lost a lot of the vegetation and a lot of the cover that retards and slows down runoff in particular. In Australia, when we get very intense fires, it consumes and burns the majority of the vegetation, including the ground litter and the canopy. Uh, and this results in um, rain events that happen soon after the fires creating huge amounts of runoff, much higher than we would have seen prior to the fire. And this creates increasingly a large amount of problems in Southeast Australia. You'll see there in the left-hand corner, uh, the photo is a Melbourne University researcher, and you'll see an arrow above him. He's in a gully that's been impacted by what we call post-fire debris flow. And you can see the scar on the tree where the bark has been removed. That's how high the, the mud flow has been in that gully. The center image there shows um, a, a, a gully that has been completely eroded down to bedrock. And the bottom right hand corner shows a house that's been impacted by one of these post fire landslides. These events in Australia have been fatal. They killed a firefighter back in 2003. They've destroyed no, numerous houses, mine sites, roads, bridges and they impact very heavily on water quality, in particular, Melbourne's water supply, which is the second biggest city in Victoria. I'll talk a bit about that in a second, and I'll talk about how we rely on data to try and resolve a lot of the risks that we experience. So it's not just Southeast Australia that gets these problems. The, the West Coast of the United States, particularly in California, also shares the same climatic and fire regimes that we do, and they have very similar problems. In 2018, in the suburb of Los Angeles, uh, a whole suburb was destroyed and 22 people tragically lost their lives. This is an example of one closer to home in Australia. Um, this is a school camp that was impacted on by a post-fire landslide. Interestingly, this wasn't after a wildfire. This was after a planned burn that the department I work for um, carries out to try and manage fuel loads. So there's a very different liability scenario when we actually create and are responsible for the fire. And this business is currently taking the Victorian government to court for damages caused by this post-fire landslide. Uh, this is the same event. This was a house that was destroyed. Um, so it's not only landslides, we also get flash floods. This was a, a house that was impacted by a flash flood um, back in 2018. Um, of more interest to the topic today is water quality. So these post-fire landslides are the largest driver by orders of magnitude of poor water quality in Australia. What you're looking at there is the Tambo River. It's one of the biggest rivers in Eastern Victoria. Um, and it was very heavily impacted on by very poor water quality after the 2019-2020 fires. 
And this is Thompson Reservoir. This is Melbourne, which is Australia's second largest city. It's its most crucial water supply reservoir. It accounts for between 60 and 70% of Melbourne's water supply. And this reservoir is extremely vulnerable to post-fire water quality impact. And it's very vulnerable because the water quality that normally flows into this reservoir is extremely good, but after fire, it's extremely bad. And um, it hasn't yet been designed to properly withstand uh, post-fire water quality events. Um, hence, Melbourne becomes very reliable or very reliant on desalination supply. So we're trying to design some tools and methodologies to collect data and better understand these impacts so we can manage these risks. And to manage those risks, we need to understand why these events happen. They happen in Southeast Australia because we have highly productive forests, we have extreme fire weather, we have very steep mountainous upland landscapes, and those all combine to create high magnitude post-fire erosion events. And as I said, there's really only two places in the world that get these, get these events, Southeast Australia and the, the West Coast of the United States. So once we understand all of these components, we can start to pull apart where they happen, why they happen, and how we can manage them in the future. So with the University of Melbourne, we've produced a model called Hydrofire. It allows us to model and understand debris flow, which is landslide risk, water quality risk, flash flood risk, and water yield risk. So the impact to the amount of water that our catchments generate as well after fire. To attribute this model, we're reliant on a lot of data. Um, with the University of Melbourne, uh, they have been collecting a lot of data in the field, very time sensitive data that has to be collected immediately after fires. This data relates to the way water moves in the soil profile amongst different soil types in different aridities, different landscapes, different forest types. Uh, they've also collected a huge database of post-fire debris flows, so post-fire landslides, where they happen in the landscape, where they've been recorded, so we can then use that information to validate and calibrate these models. So it allows us to predict where they're most likely to happen after fire events. We're also very reliant on climate data. We need to understand which parts of the state of Victoria um, are most likely to have intense rainfall events. So there's lots of analysis of rainfall radar information to understand the distribution of rainfall across Victoria. So by collecting all of this data, it allows us to model and produce more data. So we produce information about where and when we're likely to get these events after fires, how much uh, turbidity, or how much sediment load these events will mobilize, and then how long they will create dirty, work, dirty water for. So how long they will take water reservoirs offline. So how long will towns like Melbourne indeed potentially be out of water after a fire event? This slide here shows you example output from the hydrofire model for a fire that impacted Melbourne's largest water supply reservoir back in 2018. Um, so this wasn't the most recent big fires, this was actually the fire season before. And we ran the model for the burnt area and it produces a whole suite of output, which I'll talk about now. The colors underneath in this map are burn severity. So the black, or sorry, the red areas are the most severe fire um, where it has consumed the whole canopy and the greener areas are uh, less severe fire. And the red dots are catchment headwaters. So if you look at the top right-hand corner, um, that's an approximately two hectare catchment headwater, which each of those dots represents one of those little headwaters. And the number assigned at each of those dots is the probability of that headwater generating a post-fire landslide in the next 12 months. And what this model allows us to do is understand which little gullies or catchment headwaters are most likely to generate poor water quality flowing into this crucial water supply reservoir. And that allows 
uh, Melbourne Water, which is the authority which manages Melbourne's water supply to design um, a system of mitigating post-fire erosion risk. So this is a map here of some of those headwaters and some of the um, tools that have been used to try and stop huge amounts of runoff post-fire. So as you can see, this catchment has been burnt um, and silt curtains have been installed to try and hold back runoff events to try and stop these post-fire debris flows from initiating. So in this instance, there were over one and a half kilometres of these fences installed in the Thompson Reservoir to protect Melbourne's water supply. Additional to this, um, there were other uh, physical installations put in, so check dams to try and hold back poor water quality events um, and to try and hold them back from impacting the reservoir. We've also used the hydrofire model to not just look at water quality, to, but to also understand the impact of these landslides potentially hitting residential areas. So this is some very new output from the model. This is only produced in the last few weeks. The areas shown in grey are residential areas and the black lines, the heavy black lines, are potential debris flow paths. So as you can see, we get a good understanding of which residential areas could impact, be impacted post fire. And that allows us to inform planning scheme. So to regulate where development can happen, but also to inform property owners um, that do happen to have development um, and other asset owners for key infrastructure or key biodiversity assets like threatened um, aquatic species, certain fish and um, mammalian species. Um, and we have indeed in Victoria relocated some very rare fish species before um, prior to them being impacted by these very large water impacting events. So this is a zoom in of that previous slide. So we can actually pinpoint which houses um, could be impacted. So each of those gray polygons is a roof area and each of the pink ones are houses that potentially could be hit by post-fire debris flow. So this allows us to design community um, communication programs and to work with the community to help them understand the risks that they face. So there's some other data that's extremely useful for us as well. And this is looking into the future um, about the impact that climate change has on the likelihood of experiencing intense rainfall events in Victoria. So over the last 20 to 30 years, we've seen a marked increase in the amount of intense rainfall events happening in Victoria. Um, this is in line with lots of other places around the world under climate change. Um, so what you can see here is a map of Victoria in which areas have already experienced um, an increase in intense rainfall. So this allows us to understand which parts of the state are more likely to see an increasing level of these post-fire landslide events. So that's the completion of my um, slides. Um, I'm happy to take questions later on and I'll let Rudy and the rest um, manage that process. Thank you for your time and I look forward to interacting with a few of you later on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charlie. This was such an excellent overview of a very specific problem actually you are facing in Australia and as well what's happening in California. Um, so you are doing both actually the research as well as advising the government on what policy to take on or how to change it. And um, well, you're doing that specifically in the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning of the state of Victoria, which is in the far southeast of Australia, and you focus on the forest fires and the regions around it. Um, just a very quick question already from me, like if you show these maps and imagine your house is on the map being highlighted in pink, do you sometimes get like reactions from those homeowners that they see their own house stating on the map and kind of freak out? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. And th that map I showed that is very preliminary. That model is only producing that result as of a few weeks ago. So that, that data 
isn't um, yet uh, public. Um, so we, I, I appreciate that this is going out on YouTube, um, but we will be having a, a consultation um, phase in the future where we'll actually make these models public. Um, and we will then interact with property owners and we'll inform them about the risk and the likelihood of the risk and what they can do to actually mitigate those risks. We do have a team um, after every large fire that gets deployed to um, immediately understand these risks and then communicate that to householders. Um, in the past, we haven't had the capability to produce maps like that. So for the next fires that we do have, we will be able to produce maps to that level of accuracy. Um, and I'll be then able to answer your question a lot more <laughs> clearly as How to- How people respond to it. Yeah, that's yeah. right. But we're hoping to, um, to be in, to operate before the fire actually happens. So we can actually inform people um, before the fire. So they've got a lot of time to prepare. Um, and so they can appropriately understand the risk just because their house is highlighted in pink doesn't 100% mean they'll be impacted. It requires the fire and then it requires the rainfall event. So we can give them a probability, which is sometimes the probabilities are low and sometimes they're high. And um, that's all part of what we want to do as well as explain that. Yes, definitely. Thank you very much for your presentation. I do see this is a message, message as well for people who are attending the webinar live right now. Some Q&A questions are coming in already. We will pick them up after Kaspar, the second speaker, has done his presentation. So please keep them coming, those, um, those questions. We do see them. You can also upvote them. And we also have a poll for all of you attending. And that's popping up right now. As we're coming out of a very long, it seems to me like a never-ending summer, but now halfway September, things are changing. We have this very question for you. How much hinder did you experience from drought this summer? wherever you are at the moment or where you spend your summer, even better put, did you experience drought not at all, some or a lot? And we see the numbers coming in, like two thirds of you is saying some, one fourth is saying a lot of hinder and about 13% is saying not at all. And the numbers are changing. We now see all of these answers coming in. And that obviously depends on your situation. I spoke to people who live in a tiny apartment facing south here in the Netherlands, which becomes very warm, temperatures of 35 degrees inside and not a place to escape, but also uh, people who love the sun and spend all summer on the beach, obviously. So thanks for all of your answers. We now see not at all 14%, some hinder about 63% and 24% goes to a lot of hinder. Um, thanks for that. Just getting getting an overview how you experience your summer and especially droughts. Now we move on to the second speaker. So thanks for now, Charlie. We see you back in a bit. And may I introduce yet and again Casper Gele, researcher both with Wageningen University and Research and also at Wetsus. And he's taking us along. Here we go. We see his slides on data-driven decision-making for robust drinking water distribution. And this involves a lot of centering as well. I can already tell. Kasper, the floor is all yours. Please take it away. Uh, thank you, Rudy. So indeed, uh, I will talk to you about uh, drinking water, the drinking water system. Um, and let me start. Oh, sorry. I should be like this. Yes, let me start with uh, with this. Um, there's some challenges in drinking water. We want to lose as little water as possible because, uh, as the, the poll might have uh, already uh, introduced, uh, it, we have drier and drier summers. And it, it's of critical importance that we use the available water uh, as best as we can, especially looking towards how our climate is changing. So we've had some drought in the Netherlands, um, but at the same time, we still lose some water. And um, I don't know if you experience drought a lot, probably in the Netherlands, since we have still a quite excellent system, it's not that bad. But for example, we had some bans on uh, irrigation, on sprinkling your garden or washing your car. So there is some time when the, the drinking water so sources are under stress. Uh, and then even there were recommendations or, or uh, um, things that water companies ask you to do to save on water. Um, and then if at the same time water is lost in leakages, that's an unwanted phenomena. So we should try to minimize the water loss. 
And that brings me to what I've been doing a lot in my research. And that basically is how to, ins up to, how to obtain insight into and enact control over the water distribution process. Uh, the drinking water grid is buried on the ground. There are all pipes and water is going everywhere through them, but it's very hard to actually know what's going on in this buried network. Um, but at the same time, you want to reduce water loss and ensure safe and reliable drinking water for everyone. So those are the challenges that, that I try to, to tackle in my research. Um, basically, you can talk about two different methods of, of leakage control, uh, let's call it, leakage control strategies. At, at the one uh, part, you have the reactive leakage control, meaning that you try to detect if a leakage is occurring, you try to localize where this leakage is, and then fix, repair the pipe, replace the pipe so that the leakage is solved, the water loss is uh, minimized, and there's minimal disruption to customers. Uh, so to, to basically react as fast as possible. On the other side, it's a lot of proactive leakage control, uh, which means trying to prevent leakages. So that would be like uh, the work that uh, Charlie's also doing. Of course, he's trying to warn households uh, in advance before something bad happens. So this is basically uh, even better if you can prevent something altogether, uh, uh, that's uh, ideal. And if you talk about drinking water, then you're thinking about replacing older pipes uh, when they are in danger of breaking in the future. Or you can optimize uh, how the, the pump settings are, are done or how the valve configurations in the network are so that you do not stress the network too much with, with different pressure uh, uh, differences, for example. So there's also proactive leakage control. So uh, buried pipes, drinking water network, what are we talking about? Well, uh, one way that we get a lot of insight in what's happening in this drinking water network is by using various sensors. So we have a lot of flow and pressure sensors placed in the network, like in the schematic on the left. Uh, the black green symbols represent sensors. And what do these do? These are basically just uh, meter devices that take measurements every few seconds uh, of the, the water flow speeds in this drinking water network or the pressure in the drinking water network. And we are interested in these because they tell us uh, what is happening there. Uh, for example, if you look at the, the water flow speed, that is sort of a measure of the amount of, of water demand uh, from the customers. Uh, at night, there's low flow speeds, there's low uh, water usage because most people are in bed. And similar to traffic, we have two rush hour peaks during the day uh, where people use a lot of water. And that is in the morning and in the afternoon when everyone gets back to, from work. And as you can see in the graph on the right, uh, this pattern basically repeats every day. It's a very structural time series. Uh, the, a lot of people together are quite predictable in when they use water. And that offers some opportunities by measuring uh, indeed the flow and the pressure network and then obtaining these kind of data ranges, uh, we can uh, actually uh, also help us with this leakage control uh, uh, that I've been talking about. So um, I have here again some sensor data in blue. We have real-time sensor data and real-time new measurements are added to a cloud database um, of what is the actual uh, flow in the network. And since it's so regular, we can use past measurements to make a forecast, a prediction of future measurements. So you can predict what will be the water demand uh, at some time in the future. I show you the forecast in orange here. Uh, and what might already be obvious from this graph is that there are some points where actually more water is used than uh, based on the forecast you expect that customers will use. So at this point in time, we see that the uh, blue uh, has a way higher value than our orange forecast. So we lose more water than we think our customers are using. So that would mean that probably this is a burst, a leakage in the pipe and water is lost in some other way instead of being consumed. And so therefore this, this forecasting of water demand is a quite powerful technique to help us with the reactive leakage control, the detection of, of leakages, if a leakage is occurring in the network. And I also uh, did a lot of research on this topic where I focused on also presenting false positives because of course you do not want to wake up the mechanic at night to telling him there's a leakage. While uh, there might actually not be a leakage happening, it might be a soccer match or uh, in Christmas, we also have a different uh, water consumption pattern than we uh, see in previous days. Uh, but there can be a lot of events going on that are not leakages that still cause such an alarm to be triggered. So it's very important that we uh, optimize these methods and we make sure that the forecast is uh, as strong as possible. Um, so step one is detecting leakages, 
but then we still need to to find where exactly is this leakage occurring uh, in order to be able to actually resolve uh, the water loss event and prevent this loss of water. Um, so if detection is, is already done, if we have detected a leakage, the next step is localization. So then you want to determine exactly which pipe in the network uh, is leaking. Uh, often customers are of great help. They will probably call if they have no water coming from the tap or if they see that a street is flooded because a drinking water, water pipe has burst. Um, but at the one side, um, you don't really want to uh, ask your customers to, to experience this problem before you can fix it. it. Ideally, you would detect and localize yourself before the customers experience any hinder. Uh, and secondly, <clears throat> not all leakages are uh, directly visible um, to customers. But there's another method to do this. We can also localize where leakage is occurring by uh, looking at the sensor data together with a computer model of the entire network. If we have a, a computer model, an hydraulic model of all the pipes and the flows happening there, together with the sensor data, you have this virtual copy. Um, that can also help you for specific sensor measurements determine where exactly this leakage is occurring. Uh, this is quite a strong technique. It's quite uh, data intensive, but it does work to pinpoint where leakage is happening. So basically, we need sensors and hydraulic model to, to be able to localize where uh, a pipe has burst and where the leakage is occurring. And especially in uh, uh, sensor placement, I also uh, try to, to help in this problem because in theory, we have a nice network full of sensors, but in practice, we don't measure everything and it's a bit costly placing a lot of sensors. So you want to place sensors in a smart way so they help you the most when you want to localize these leakages. Uh, and that's also something I tackled in research, uh, how to, where to place additional pressure sensors in the network so that we maximize observability. Uh, what do I mean by that? That means that if I place a sensor, I will get a lot of information from that specific location in the drinking water network. But I want to place a sensor in such a way that together with the other sensors already there, they maximize the amount of information I get from the entire water network. So that the combination of sensors gives you as much insight in as large an area of buried pipes as possible. And there's a mathematical measure for that, observability, that basically helps us color code the network, so to say, and pinpoint the exact region uh, where an, an additional sensor will help us most uh, obtain a better view of the entire network, so that it uh, also strengthens all these localization methods. Uh, I talked to you about flow and pressure sensors, which are very important in drinking water, but there's a lot of uh, development going on uh, regarding uh, sensor development, especially within WETSUS. There's a lot of also sensors being developed that are of great help here. Uh, there's already being in use. There are these robots as shown on the left that can crawl through drinking water pipes that measure the state of the pipe. So they measure if the pipe is still okay, if it's degraded, maybe it should be replaced. Uh, and there are still developments going on to perfect this method, as well as smart pipes, uh, which means that uh, it's basically a new pipe where sensors already embedded in the pipe material so that we can just on demand read out the status of a pipe. Um, and another important technique, especially when we talk about uh, data usage is soft censoring. Um, which has been used for a long time, uh, but, but now with the AI onset, we can do even more wonderful things with it. Um, for example, in the past, miners often used to take a canary bird with them into the mines, because if in the mine toxic gases were being released, those gases could not be smelled by humans, but from a certain a threshold, they would be toxic and lethal even. Um, however, you, humans could not detect it, so they would bring the birds, and the bird has a lower tolerance for, for these toxic gases. So when the bird stops tweeting, or even when the bird falls over, then the miner should run out of the mine. So this canary bird is a soft sensor for um, toxic gas buildup. It, it's not, you're not measuring the gas, you're using an indirect sensor to measure another property. And this technique now is also used in a lot of different ways. For example, in uh, drinking water or surface water, there's always a lot of micro pollutants, maybe some medicine residues or some pesticides, and it's very hard to measure all of those. But we can just sample the bacteria in drinking water, for example, and then measure if these bacteria have reacted to these, these micro pollutants. 
it's it's easier to measure the, the reaction of bacteria than to measure all the possible toxic compounds. So then the bacteria act as a soft sensor. Same is true uh, of, for example, uh, oxychlorides in water, also something you want to prevent, um, but we can measure the acidity, the salt concentration. We can all measure a lot of chemical properties uh, in water and translate those properties using AI into a measure of this hard to measure property we're looking for. So there's a lot of development going on in, in sensors that help us get more insight in drink water systems, but also other water systems uh, uh, in use. I talked a bit about reactive leakage control, center placement. Let me quickly tell you something about proactive leakage control. So really prevention of water loss. Uh, so you want to detect a problem in an early stage before it, it really gets out of hand. Uh, and we have so-called early warning systems for those. So you want some system that triggers an automatic warning when a problem occurs. Um, for leakages uh, or deteriorated, deteriorated pipes, uh, we have, for example, these, these robots we can send through uh, malfun malfunctioning pumps. There are some, some things you can do to see if, if this is going uh, optimally. I will go into detail a bit more in a minute. And with various soft sensors, we can also look at, at some pollutants contaminants before those levels become uh, uh, dangerous. So um, how to prevent the leakage? It's, it's very hard to, to say which pipe will break tomorrow. That, that's basically impossible due to all the factors happening. But there's some steps you can do to locate which assets are probably under too much stress and thus should be replaced uh, or action should be taken to prevent the leakage. Uh, I myself did a lot of work in pattern recognition where, for example, I show you again this image of a burst pipe on top here on the right. Uh, that's a leakage from 2013. Uh, it's shown here in one week of pressure data from a pressure sensor in red. Um, but we see that also in the week before this leakage is occurring, and even months before this leakage was occurring, we have very large pressure uh, oscillations, very uh, uh, intense changes in pressure at some points uh, uh, in, this, in this data that is visible. So that means that there's really big pulses of pressure going through this pipe that have eventually led to this leakage. So I looked into can we... Uh, detect these recurring harmful patterns and then of course take action before they um, lead to a leakage and in this case it was some settings of pumps that could be improved to prevent these these very big pressure spikes and if this was timely detected this leakage could have been stopped in this uh, example data set so that's also a way to um, take action before something leads to a leakage um, then just a general view of our current challenges and prospects uh, in this field. So measuring is really knowing. I think that's the important part. Uh, if, you, if you have a lot of data, you can make very strong recommendations and uh, uh, manage your system as best as possible. And uh, there's a lot of new sensors that can help us with this uh, because data is power. Uh, I think uh, Charlie will probably also agree with it. Um, he also has to send his teams out to collect the data as fast as possible. And of course, the more data comes in, the stronger these models become and the, the better that you can manage your system. Um, proactive leakage control is a more difficult one than reactive leakage control. That doesn't mean that a fast response is not as important. They're both techniques that should be invested in. Uh, and it's important that you do uh, a lot of data processing. You have early warning systems, soft sensors. And ideally you do this within your own organization uh, so that you do not have to outsource um, um, the, the processing of the data you collect yourself, but you can unlock the hidden information uh, yourself. Also the combination of data streams is very important. Uh, for example, the inspections of pipes can help to improve the hydraulic computer models so that in the end you get a very robust system, you combine your data streams and then you get to something like a digital twin, which we hear a lot about uh, nowadays where you want to build a, a very realistic, real-time running virtual copy uh, of your system so that you can in real-time see what's going on and you can even make simulations for the future. Uh, and then within Wageningen, I'm involved of a digital twin of uh, the wastewater management and surface water streams, also focusing on drought mitigation and preparation, uh, where we really go look into uh, uh, how to combine all the available data to even obtain more insight and information about the systems and thus empower the organizations to better manage um, their systems in case of, of these extreme situations. And with that, I hope, hope to have given you an overview of the, the various uh, topics that I've been working on. 
Uh, and I want to thank you for the attention. And I'm interested to see what, what kind of discussion we can start up. Yes, thank you very much, Kaspar Hele. Thanks so much for actually the both presentations. So maybe Charles, Charlie, maybe you wanna join us as well. Um, thanks in advance to the both of you already for these two very clear and also very pleasantly provided presentations. That's maybe a good call to action already for the people in the audience. The live stream will be put on YouTube and maybe afterwards you can share the link with some other colleagues of yours that might be interested um, in this as well. I did see some of the questions came in already and we will cover those um, in a few minutes time. But um, yeah, you've been referring to each other as well, Kasper, you did as well, especially for the quality of drinking water, which was one common topic in the both uh, stories, obviously, whether it was in pipes, in the ground, or in the reservoir. Are there some things that you picked up from each other, maybe, that you learned from each other that were insightful for your own position as well? Maybe you can share a thing or two. Yeah, de definitely for me. I mean, being a, a geologist and being concerned mostly with the, the catchment areas, I, I don't have a lot of exposure then to water risks around the distribution network. Uh, so it's fascinating for me to see um, how uh, water quality from other aspects is dealt with and how important data is, um, not just in the supply of water, but in the, the distribution network as well. Most definitely. We are in the connected systems, of course. Uh, sooner or later, the, the, the surface waters and these catchment waters, they will probably become drinking water. It's all a cycle. Uh, and, and these are all just different parts of that cycle. Uh, but I think it's important to realize that everything is connected and that uh, you need to make sure everything at every moment and every place in the cycle uh, goes as well as possible to prevent also issues yeah. later on when you want to, for example, make drinking water of some polluted area, uh, let's say. Mm. Yeah. Well, if I speak for myself, I love these very specific presentations because often even more than I wish me as a host I find myself sometimes in situations with presentations that are very general and then I think okay nice to speak about innovation but what did we learn you know here there are some very nice takeaways already like the maps that um, Charlie has shown us and as well the 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 robot or the crawling sensor that we've seen uh, in one of the slides of uh, Kaspar there are also some questions coming in and um, actually the one I wanted to pick up first is for Charlie. You showed us some barriers around the Thompson Reservoir to prevent the slide off. And one of the person, and I was actually thinking the same, have these fences barriers actually been successful? Because they kind of looked a little bit wobbly to be very honest. Or were they yeah, successful? Look, th that, that's a, a very valid question. and. The reason those barriers are installed, it, it isn't necessarily to hold back all of the water or in, indeed to hold back dirty water. What, what they're designed to do is they're right in the catchment headwaters. What they're trying to do is stop water starting to run off because what happens when we have extremely burnt catchments or burnt to an extreme degree, um, the Americans call it lock and load. So you get water starting to run off it collects a bit of debris, it dams up a little bit, like just small, maybe just the size of my laptop here. Water pulls in behind it, it releases again, but this time with more energy, picks up bigger sediment and it does again, but maybe the size of a table. So, and eventually they get so big and the huge dam releases and it's hyper erosive. So what those barriers are trying to do at the very top of the catchment is to stop runoff and to stop runoff uh, velocity. So to try to slow the speed of the runoff water. So yeah, although they look flimsy, they're actually highly effective. And um, you, you could use a lot of other um, vegetative um, type options like hay bales or coir logs. Um, but a lot of Thompson Dam's water supply reservoir area is national park. And there's a lot of sensitivity about what materials can be used in there. So inert materials like um, metal and plastic fencing is often preferred. Um, so to directly answer the question, um, yeah, there were no post-fire landslides 
seen in the Thompson Reservoir after that fire. Um, there were normal rainfall events experienced, nothing, um, yeah, nothing of a huge magnitude, but even still, a one in one year thunderstorm event is typically enough to trigger a landslide after a fire and there was not one triggered. So, um, and Melbourne's water supply was not impacted. So yeah, I'd have to say that they were successful, um, but there was a lot learned from that process. Um, and it's not often that we can justify spending that amount of time or money. It's just that that water reservoir is obviously very high risk. Yeah, and quite unique and valuable, obviously. So we can regard them as being sort of speed bumps, as to say, to, to simplify that's right. it a little bit, maybe. Excellent. That's a that's a good one. And then also in that category, to, to stay with you, Charlie, just for uh, one more moment, like the post-fire water quality, what kind of chemical composition are we talking about? What is the stuff the you problem. actually don't want to get in your reservoir? So the biggest problem obviously is turbidity. So um, dissolved solids, um, that, that's the primary problem because a lot of the water treatment systems aren't designed, well, they're designed to deal with a certain amount of turbidity, but the amount of um, dissolved sediment introduced into a reservoir by these post-fire debris flows is orders of magnitude higher than standard erosional processes. So very, very high sediment loads is the primary problem. Um, then there's problems around the introduction of nutrients um, and potential algal bloom problems, and also um, extra organic matter and the impact that that has on dissolved oxygen. So that there's a suite of issues that are created um, within water supply reservoirs. Yeah, thank you very much, thanks. Moving on to Caspar, it's actually a question that I asked you as well in the preparation of this very webinar. Um, um, <clears throat> Marluz is asking, how much drinking water do you think is lost per year by leakage on average? Is there a number to be mentioned? Uh, there are some numbers you can look up. The absolute amount of water, I don't dare to guess. Uh, I'll have to look it up. But uh, a relative, it's 5% uh, of drinking water is what they call non-revenue water, which means that's water that's either lost due to leakages, but there's also things like firefighting or even the, the drinking water taps on the, the, the train stations where everyone can go and get drinking water for free. Those are in there too. Um, but at least I would say... Uh, quite a fraction of it is, is lost due to leakages. So 5% of the yeah. total. And a single yeah. leakage can lose over 50,000 uh, cubic meters. Uh, that would be a big one that's not detected very fast, but those are numbers that, that can be lost in a single leakage even. Yeah. And then maybe I'm thinking about it right now. And as we are in an international context anyways, this is focused on the Netherlands. Maybe we have quite a robust system already. But I once read like in cities, all the cities like London or Rome in Italy, there you have like maybe 10 or sometimes 20%. 20, still. 30, it uh, goes even higher in some places. So we're doing quite fine. Uh, but still, I would say 5% of total water. Uh, well, not all of that is lost due to leakages, but there's still a lot of cubic yeah. meters lost and a lot you can improve there. And maybe a yeah. problem is a bit, water's too cheap. Uh, I think we're realizing too more cheap. and more, it's very important but it, it, it's ridiculously cheap to, to uh, have drinking water from the tap, which means, of course, that there's, there's a lot of attention for it, but maybe we should focus on it a bit more, seeing how, for example, the climate is changing. And how valuable it is, like it is right up there in the pyramid of Maslow, just after Wi-Fi, I would say. So it's invaluable, <laughs> I, I reckon. But the point I wanted to touch upon maybe is, is your group or the university also thinking of exporting this knowledge also to other places, maybe, that they can also uh, benefit from? Yeah, of course. Uh, the Netherlands is an, an uh, ideal uh, test garden, maybe, let's say, uh, due to we can experiment with sensor data already there. But especially when talking about uh, um, making these, these computer uh, models, uh, you can use them for any network where there are some sensors. And also the sensor development, of course, uh, is also made to, to be able to use in different areas. Uh, there's different sensors all also being tested uh, in research already uh, and also looked at, at cheaper ways of measuring a network. 
Um, so that's definitely something that that's taken into account. And also this research is also uh, supported by a lot of international uh, parties that also look for doing this in the European, but even also global uh, setting. Yeah. Yeah. And especially where you work at Wetsus, that's all already European, that's international already. Yeah. Anna is asking, maybe she has a, a schooler child, or maybe she is herself a very early schooler. What line of study would you advise high school graduates to pursue in light of water crises? What kind of professionals, professionals do we need in the near future? Who has um, an idea on that? If we, if we talk about solving these issues, so let's call it the, the technical side of, of things. Uh, well, you notice from both our presentations, uh, data is becoming more and more important. To, so there should definitely be some aspect of, of data processing uh, in there, uh, which also most studies uh, probably incorporate uh, at this point. But anything from uh, uh, process technology um, to, to even indeed uh, geology, or there's even just a climate uh, uh, masters or environmental research, uh, those kind of, of studies, I think, uh, suit this kind of work best. If you take that path, you will be guaranteed with work for the upcoming decennia. I think from a lot of different places, you can tackle this problem and you will get where you want, want to, um, but, but those will definitely have the option for you to specialize in this direction, I would say, yeah. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Charlie, you uh, showed us also a model, the hydro fire model. And Simon is asking to what extent can the methodology to assign hydro geomorphic risks be used in other regions, which also face high chances of slides. So maybe the context is a little bit different, but maybe the model can be adapted. I don't know. Yeah, so I assume that question means, can it be applied to areas that haven't been impacted by fire. Um, no, well, I guess that there's there's some similarities, um, but no, the, the, there's a lot of um, particular research done looking at the way that different landscapes in Southeast Australia respond after fire and how they respond hydrologically. And that's what hydro fire is geared around. It's It's geared around um, soil types, aridity is a very large driver. So how arid the site is, and that relates to soil development, poor soil development relates to less infiltration and more runoff. So yeah, I guess there's some components that, that could be used potentially to look at other debris flows, but no, the, the hydrofire model is very specifically designed to look at post-fire hydrological impacts. Fair enough, fair enough. That's an honest answer. We appreciate that. Someone is also stating a, a tip if you are very much interested in this very topic on the, the fire as well. Um, it's by the UCPA, if I pronounce it correctly, and the webinar is called Wildfires and Resulting Impacts to Water Bodies Used as Drinking Water Sources. So that's maybe worthwhile to Google. If it went too quick, just uh, go back five seconds and uh, You'll hear it again. Um, Kaspar, one of the final questions, what type of sensors do you recommend to use for detection of water losses? Is pressure and flow sufficient or do you need also uh, others? What kind of sensors do you need? I think these are tried and tested and proven to be, uh, let's call it the backbone of, of really uh, obtaining insight of your system. Uh, you start with flow sensors, then pressure sensors are very important. And I would say third is this hydraulic computer model where the combination of sensor data and a computer model give you even more insight. And when you have the, the water quantity problem solved then water quality sensors uh, are important because water quality is a concentration. Concentration relies on water quantity. So you need to have insight in the whole quantity aspect before you can look at the, the quality. So yes, I would say flow then pressure sensors are, are the backbone to start with to, to get insight in this, these things, yeah. Yes, excellent. And maybe just before I ask the both of you, what should be the key takeaway or some things that people could work on within their own organizations? Robert is coming with an alternative. As you know, we have these fire runoffs into a reservoir or we have leaking pipes. He is maybe suggesting are there alternative drinking water systems like underground or water big bags locally? Is that maybe a solution? Because 
all of this is going to cost us a lot of money to maintain as well. Why not invest in an alternative? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, water retention is, is one of the, the major things offered as a solution to, to drought issues uh, at the moment. If we can in winter retain more water, uh, then of course you can use this in summer. Um, so, so that's something that they're currently looking into and that's more of a, a, a bigger problem where more uh, utilities, more organizations are involved uh, because where then should this water be stored? Can we put this underground or is this like surface lakes where we can store it? Uh, but that's definitely one of the things that has a high interest now seeing that we have uh, uh, floods, uh, river floods in, 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 in winter and we have drought in summer. So if you can spread this water throughout time, we would have solved our problem basically. Yeah. Yeah. And how is that in Australia? Yeah, Robert raises a good point and a very pertinent one here. So um, some of the smaller regional centres that are very close to the mountains um, near where I live, um, they have installed groundwater bores to, to spread their risk so they're less reliant on, on river systems. And that's driven by the impact that those towns had after very big fires here in 2003. Um, Melbourne, clearly, it's a very big city, um, 4 million people. Um, groundwater bores won't be able to meet their supply needs, but um, there's been very large investment into desalinisation. Um, and that wasn't so much to deal with post-fire water quality risks, more so to deal with, with drought risk. So, yeah, by diversifying um, water supply, um, yeah, a, a lot of Australian centres are already mostly due to water shortages from drought have um, inadvertently also helping to protect themselves from post fire water quality as well. Yeah, excellent. I see we are nearing the end of this webinar. For me, the biggest takeaway is that sometimes you get overrun with negative news, like the world is going to pieces. But for me, this was such an optimistic hour from two experts that are working very hard together with their team and colleagues to get things done and to actually be part of the solution instead of only repeating the problem. So that was very insightful for me. Thanks for that. Is there something the two of you want to add on to that? Like a final shout out or a, a key takeaway for maybe the people that are watching this live stream? I'd just like to add how the getting back to the the subject matter today, the importance of data um, in resolving these risks, both for Casper and my situation, we're heavily reliant on the collection of information, the interpretation of that information, and then applying what we've learnt. Um, so new ways of collecting, storing, analysing, and implementing data um, is really gonna be crucial to keeping our water systems, um, yeah, adaptable to a changing climate. Excellent, and Caspar? Yeah, same. I think it's by now definitely proven that, that data plays a large role. You cannot literally plug a leakage with data, but then again, it can give you so much overview and pinpoint so much stuff that the actual response is, is way more targeted and way more efficient. And I think uh, data definitely plays a large role in, in mitigating a lot of these problems. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us, joining us from Australia in the far southeast of it in the state of Victoria, Charlie Showers the researcher and also policy advisor, and also Kasper from the Netherlands, Wageningen University and Research, and as well Wetsus that he spoke from this very morning. For the people back home, thanks a lot as well. My colleague just shared a link in the chat for a small little survey. How did you like this hour? Did you like it? Please tell us. And we'd love to see you next time, which will be on October 21st. And then we will dive into riparian management led by the landscape. If you have any suggestions whatsoever, get in contact with us, check the website or send us an email. And a great thanks for all of the sponsors that made this possible, our partners in setting up this series. We would love to see you again. This was Climate Adaption, harnessing data to make the water system more robust. Have a great day and see you later. Bye-bye.